going to go ahead then and move on in our study of the book of James. We got through the first 11 verses last uh, week. Let me get us up to speed here. Okay. We got through the first 11 verses. We're going to begin today at the 12th verse. But before we do, let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for today and the opportunity that we have to come into this place as children of God. Lord, we come boldly before the throne of grace. As your word declares, it's our privilege as your children. We do not need to sheepishly come before you. We do not need to quietly and passively come before you. But you declare, O oh God, that we have the right and the privilege to come boldly before the throne of grace. And Master, tonight, O oh God, we just ask that you would be present in this Bible study in a wonderful way. Anoint the teacher, anoint the student, anoint those gods that would listen by reason of the internet, both live and those that will watch at a later date and time. Master today, work through this study. Help your word to speak to our heart today, O oh God. Allow the illumination of the Holy Ghost to shine upon our hearts and minds today. Let us walk away with a revelation of your grace. Let us walk away with a revelation of your power. And more importantly than this, let us walk away with a revelation of your person. Help us, God, to know who you are. Help us, God, to understand today just exactly who you are. Master, today, O oh God, move in this, uh, in this service today, O oh God. Bless us, help us encourage our faith, help us to stand on higher ground than ever before we've stood. Grant it, Master, for, oh, and Lord, today, God, I lift up Mr. Burgess before you. Master, we know, according to the promise of God's Word, that you are a healer. In the Old Testament, you declare, I am the Lord that healeth thee. The Word of God promises He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes we are healed. In the name of Jesus, Master, right now, I just ask God that the healing virtue of the Lord Jesus Christ would flow in that man's direction. God, just touch his spirit, touch his mind, touch his body right now. Let the doctors be confounded. Let scientists be confounded today, oh God. Let a miracle occur in that body. We lift him up before you, Lord. We intercede on his behalf and ask you, God, to perform a great miracle in his body for the glory of God through the name of Jesus Christ. Grant it, God, we pray. And Lord, I also want to ask, before forgetting, uh, we appreciate so much the time that we have been in this little facility here. And as we are having to leave before uh, our agreed time, we just ask God that you would help this property uh, to be leased out in very, very swift fashion. Master, let it be written before we've even left. Let someone step up and take over this property before we have even left. Lord, we could very much use our deposit and the possibility exists that we may have to forfeit it. But Lord, if you could somehow, some way move and make a way that we might get that back, we will be so grateful as that will help us uh, in our next endeavor. Master, all these needs today, we lift up before you with faith and confidence in your ability and your will to do that which we have asked. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Sorry about that. I almost forgot to pray for a few things and, and I wanted to make sure we... And do be praying. I would love before... <clears throat> in the next two weeks, I would love for uh, Alice to have this rented before we even leave. And I'm going to pray to that end. So let's be praying for that, okay? Yes. Amen. All right, James chapter 1, continue with our study. We're looking now, James begins to write about the source of temptation. 
And remember last week I was talking about the fact that temptation, the word temptation that we read here, it is not speaking of, look at this, isn't this pretty, don't you want to do this, don't you want to eat this, don't you want to have this. That is not what this term temptation means. This term temptation literally means trials, hardships, sufferings. Okay? What is the source of trials? What is the source of hardships? What is the source of our faith being tried? Well, James writes, verse 12, chapter 1, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Oh boy, I'm going to get into this in a minute. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust or desire hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. This is really, oh boy, is there some meat in here. i, I got to figure out if I can. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, so you see that temptation is not merely in this pretty, don't you want this? When he is tried, when you've gone through the trial, when you've gone through the tribulation, when you've gone through the difficulty, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. But verse 13 is powerful. Let no man say when he is tried, I am tried of God. For God cannot be tried. Think about it for a minute. When you go through a hardship, God don't have hardships. That's right. That's right. They ain't nothing hard for God. Right. Therefore, God doesn't know what it is to be go, to have to go through a trial, to have to go through a hardship, to have to go through a difficulty. And He said, "Neither tempteth he any man." Oh boy, this is this is important. God is above every trial, every difficulty, every stress, every tribulation we could ever face. There's not any tribulation or trial that touches God. And for that reason, listen, God does not use that tactic with us. I've said this before and I'll say it again. God does not ask His people to do anything that He will not do Himself. This is one reason why I've tried to teach and preach and help people understand that the nature of forgiveness has been misrepresented in the church for God only knows how long. A woman is raped by her dad or a child is molested by his uncle and we're told that Years later, when they become a Christian, they're told, you've got to forgive that uncle. You've got to forgive your father. You have to forgive them. Because if you don't, the Bible says God won't forgive you. Baloney, you're, you're out. you are totally misunderstanding the concept of forgiveness according to the Word of God. Let me tell you how forgiveness works in the Word of God. Forgiveness requires that the offense be acknowledged by the offender. Mm -hmm. You cannot forgive anyone for anything that they do not acknowledge. What you can do and what you should do. I'm talking the word of God, folks. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, love your enemies. Mm -hmm. Pray for them which spitefully use you. So in other words, you don't have any business running around holding a grudge. You don't have any business looking out trying to get vengeance. You don't have any business holding on to anger and malice and, and bitterness in your spirit. The Bible warns us about the root of bitterness. Okay? But you cannot forgive any transgression that has been committed against you 
unless it is first acknowledged by the transgressor. Say, brother, are you sure about I'm absolutely sure about that. Because first of all, there's one teaching in the church that is entirely wrong about forgiveness. And that is that once you're forgiven, it's forgiven, forgotten forever. That's not what the scripture says. Jesus gave the parable of the king. His servant comes into him, owes him a bunch of money. And the servant said, I'm sorry, I cannot pay you, you know. And the king says, well, then off to jail you go till you've paid every dime you owe. And the man begs and pleads. And the king has mercy on him and says, I forgive your debt. You know what? You don't owe me anymore. It's forgiven. Strike it from the books. That man leaves the room. He finds a man that owes him money. And he grabs hold of him and says, you owe me this money. And that man says, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I can't pay you, I can't pay you. And this man is ready to take this man to court and have him thrown into debtor's prison when he's just been forgiven. And somebody sees this transpire. He goes to the king and says, Did you know that man you just forgave his debt a few minutes ago? Well, he was just outside, and blah, 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 this happened. What happened in that story? The king calls him back in, and he says, All right, you know what? That forgiveness is now nullified. Hello now. Mm -hmm. That's right. You owe me everything you ever owed me, and now you're going to go to jail until everything you owe me has been paid. That forgiveness was withdrawn. My Lord have mercy. That forgiveness was withdrawn. Well, I'm here to tell you. Jesus said, if your brother sin against you, and he comes to you, and repents. What were the next two words? Forgive him. But do you see how that transaction took place? The brother comes and repents. He didn't say if your brother sins against you, forgive him. Mm -mm. He said if your brother sins against you and he comes to you and repents, forgive him. In order to forgive, forgiveness is a two-way transaction. Not a one-way. You cannot forgive without the other person knowing you've forgiven them. You cannot forgive in a wholesale fashion. Forgiveness does not work that way. What is the final test that proves my what I'm saying? God does not ask His people to do anything that He Himself does not first do. God does not forgive until we confess our sins. The Word of God said, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why would God ask us to forgive everybody wholesale? They don't have to acknowledge what they've done. They don't have to repent. They don't have to feel bad about what they've done. Just forgive them anyway, but God Himself won't do that. It doesn't work that way, folks. It doesn't work that way. You go through the entire Word of God, I promise you, I've done it. I've done, it. I've done some very extensive uh, research on this. And every time you see the word forgiveness, when it speaks of forgiveness, it speaks of it in such a fashion at times that you might think it simply means just do it. But that is not the proper context for the very concept of forgiveness. Whenever you read the word forgiveness in Scripture, it talks about forgiving and what have you, you can automatically know that that condition exists, that if this person comes to me and acknowledges this, I am obligated to forgive. I don't care if they rape me. I don't care if they beat me. I don't care if they abuse me. I don't care if they murdered my mother. I don't care what they've done. If they come to me and they acknowledge I am obligated by the Word of God to forgive. If they come to me and acknowledge and I do not forgive, 
What does the word of God say my standing before the Lord will be like? I'm on dangerous ground. That's right. Because my Father in heaven will not forgive me either. That's right. But there's always that requirement for forgiveness that confession first be made. You follow? But again, I want to repeat, a lot of people come at me with, well, if that's true, then you're saying you can not forgive and you can just be all hateful. That is not what I'm saying by a million miles. Because there are other principles in Scripture that address those issues. You have no business letting bitterness Grab hold of your heart. You have no business seeking vengeance. You have no business returning evil for evil. I can go on and on and on with a list of biblical principles that deal with how we're to respond to those who've sinned against us or done us dirty. But forgiving them without their ever acknowledging what they've done is not possible. I can't believe I'm going into this, but you know what? It's all right because this is good stuff. You need Uh to hear this let me help you understand something. I, I, I've actually preached on forgiveness and I've expounded on all this. But I'm going to help for those of you that might not have been here, those of you watching on the internet who may never have heard this. The Word of God tells us, Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Let me tell you the context in which Jesus is speaking. He's not talking about demons. If you tie a demon up, the demon's tied up. That's, that's, not, that's out of context. That is not what that means. Let me tell you the issue the Lord was talking about before he said this. F-O-R-G-I-V-E-N-E-S-S. Forgiveness. That was the issue he was addressing. And he said... Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. What does binding and loosing mean? It's very simple. Binding and loosing. You've heard the term. We have a binding contract. That's right. That means everything about it is accurate, legitimate, and legal. Everything about it meets the full conditions of the law, and therefore... This contract must absolutely be honored. What the Lord was saying was, when someone comes to you and they confess a wrong that they've done you, and you forgive them, you've just created a binding agreement that that sin is paid for. And that person, oh hallelujah, will stand before the Lord in heaven in judgment and will not answer for that offense. Because what's bound on earth is bound in heaven. If it's settled here, it is settled forever. This is why it is so imperative that God's people act the way the Word of God tells us to act. And the scripture said, if your brother offend you, what are you to do? Get teed off at him and go to another church. Uh Uh-uh. Go to him. Go to him. Why? It gives you an opportunity to settle the matter here. Uh So that in the judgment, you don't have to face it. Every issue of offense that you settle here, you will not face before the Lord. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that powerful? And listen, the scripture also tells us every offense that you recognize you've committed against somebody else, what does the Word of God tell us to do? Go to them. Same exact remedy. Same identical remedy as if Whether they offend you or you offend them. Whether they sin against you or you sin against them. It doesn't matter. The minute anyone recognizes that they have offended or been offended by another, your obligation by the Word of God is to go to them. Settle the matter. Bind it up. It is settled. In eternity, that matter will never be addressed. It will never be spoken. Isn't that powerful? This is why... When we have people in the church 
who decide they won't get teed off at the preacher for some stupid, idiotic little reason. And they go rushing off and they just talk bad about the preacher and tell everybody what a cult he's got and you know how evil they are and he's just the most terrible man on the planet. Honey, I got news for you, darling. I got news for you. You just opened a can of whoop fanny on yourself in the judgment like you can't even imagine. Because first of all, you're guilty of a an offense, you have not responded to the offense the way God said to respond to it. Right. The Lord said, settle it. Settle it. I reached out to one person who did this in our church here in Dallas. And I said, in an email, I read it to Jack, the very email I sent. I said, I know you're offended. I know you're bothered. I know you're frustrated. Come talk to me. Let's get this settled. You can still go to another church if you want to. To be honest with you, I'd rather she did, and I'm glad she did. I'll be frank. Mm -hmm. But, you can, I, I wasn't trying to keep her in our church. But what I was trying to do was honor the Word of God, do things scripturally, settle the matter so that it could be tied and sealed and settled, and it would not have to be dealt with in the judgment. No, she rebelled and refused. So, it's out of my hands. I did my part. I am without fault. Because right. I did the right thing. Right. Okay? So, I said all that to say, this is why the Lord is saying here, that the Lord is not tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. God is not tried, and he does not use that technique on others. Because God doesn't do anything. He doesn't ask you to do anything that he himself will not do. If God cannot be tried or tempted, why would he try or tempt you? Do you follow what I'm trying to say? That's, right. That's how God operates. Now, does he allow the enemy to try us? Yes. But, people say all the time, I don't understand why there's evil in the world. If God is good, then how come there's murder? And how come there's death? And how come there's sickness? And how come there... It's because of the evil one. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Don't ever put these things on God's doorstep. That's right. Because God... God is not the one who brought them into this world. God did not create humanity to be sick. God did not create humanity to die. God did not create humanity to go out in the garden and toil and struggle like we did today and sweat. And I mean, you know... <laughs> That is not how the Lord designed us. That is not how God created us. That was not His plan for us. Don't ever, don't you ever, dare ever lay evil at God's feet and try to suggest that God is responsible for this. God is responsible for sickness. God is responsible for world hunger. God is I got news for you. There are countries in Africa, Gabriel, where people are hungry and starving to death. And frankly, frankly, I won't talk real plain. A lot of the reason for that is not that the resources are not available to minister to these people, to help these people, but that those higher up in the government are as crooked as crooked can get. That's right. mm -hmm. And while organizations try to send help and try to be helpful, the greedy and the evil and the wicked in high places, in high positions, will not allow that those resources to get past them That's right. to actually reach the people. I know that for a fact. Mm -hmm. it's true. Wickedness. Mm -hmm. Wickedness. The love of money. Not money. The love of money. The love of wealth. The love of riches is the root of how much evil? Most? Oh. All evil. That's right. People want to say, well, I'll tell you what. The Christian faith has been responsible for all kinds of wickedness in the world. People have been murdered and people have been killed in the name of Christ. And, and it's religion. Religion's the problem. Uh-uh. 
Religion is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. If you look at what was motivating the religious people to do what they did, Hello now. If you look at what was motivating old Pope so-and-so to order this crusade or that crusade or this inquisition or that inquisition, at the bottom of it all, it's all about money. That's right. When you, the, you know the old saying, they talk about you're looking to find the, who committed a crime, follow the money. Law enforcement knows that that is the premier tool to find who done it. Yeah. Follow the money. Is there money involved here some way, somehow? Does this have something to do with money? Because if it does, follow the money and you'll find who did it. Every single time. The root of all wickedness, the root of all evil is the love of money. And there are those within religious circles who love money, who use their religious influence and power and authority and what have you to try to assert themselves. But the issue is not the religion they represent. The issue is their love of money. You following what I'm trying to say? All right. So... God can't be tempted. He cannot be tried. He does not use these techniques in and of himself. But listen, this is interesting what James goes on to say. He said, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when? When he is drawn away of his own lust, his own desires, and enticed. There's not a trial you'll ever go through. Oh, my, 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 my. <laughs> that if you don't look hard enough, you'll see where you brought it on yourself. That's pretty hard to hear. I know some people that have issues with taking responsibility for anything in their lives and they're going to rebuff that statement oh they're going to get mad at the preacher for saying that there is not a trial in your life that you've ever now I'm 46 years old I'll be 47 in September and I'm going to tell you something honey I've lived enough of life that I look back Jack and I know for a fact this is so I know for an absolute fact. I look back at some of the dumb things I've gone through, some of the hardships, some of the trials that I've gone through in my life. And if you trace it back to the very tippity, 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 tippity top of that iceberg, if you go to the very root, you will find that somewhere along the line, you let your desires get in the way. And that started this chain reaction. It's kind of like, Sean, you know, a little pebble hits your windshield and you get that little peck in the glass. Then after a while, that little peck starts to spread out. Next thing you know, you got this big old thing looks like a spider web on your windshield. I just started as a little speck. How many people, they wanted that apartment so bad because they could impress people. They could really be somebody. They could really show how successful and how wonderful they are and how great they're doing. And that desire made them make a decision that was against their best interests. Well, they wanted that car, Sean, so bad. And then when they're struggling to make car payments, <laughs> did God throw them into that car Jack did the Lord make them buy that car no this is one reason why one lesson I've learned in life 
And, and this is, boy, this is good tonight. Boy, I'm, I'm, I'm chewing this. Even I'm trying to tell it and I'm chewing it. This is one reason why Paul said, I have learned to be content whatsoever state I am in. Whatever my circumstance, I've learned to be okay with it. Mm -hmm. And Sean, I've learned in my life that that is the... the, the oh, th there's so much wisdom in those words. You can't even imagine how much wisdom there is in those words. If you're content where you're at, then you won't be drawn away by your lusts and your desires and wind up in a situation that brings you a trial, a hardship, or a struggle. Mm -hmm. My Lord, have mercy. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Somebody lives in a three-bedroom house with two beds and a living room and a dining room and a family. Oh, but it ain't good enough. Gotta have more. Gotta have better. Gotta have different. Tommy can tell you. God is my witness. I, this is, I, I'm so far from perfect, I can't, I can't even see perfect from where I live. I've told you that a million times. So I don't point to myself as an example because, you know, I'm Jesus and I'm walking on water. That, no. But I'm going to tell you one thing. My great-grandmother, and even my grandmother, I'll give her credit for this. Those women were gifted with the ability, Jack, to be happy wherever they were sitting. My great-grandmother could be happy. Honey, she could be sitting on a pile of worms in the middle of a field. As long as she had a tree over her head, she'd say, praise God, I got shelter. <laughs> I'm telling you, she would see the good in the worst situation. She, she, literally, she could find the good in every circumstance you ever could imagine. And she could see the good in it. And appreciate the good in it. And be satisfied where she was at. I don't know how many times I'd say to her, Oh, Grandma, I wish you could have a bigger house. I wish you could have a better place. And Grandma says, Why? This one's paid for. <laughs> Why? <laughs> the kids aren't home anymore. You know, we got four bedrooms. And when the kid, when we had ten kids living here, it was a little tight. But now that they're all gone, this is plenty for us. You see what I'm saying? She, she wasn't always looking for the next step up. We live in a world today where consumerism is preached into our head from every corner. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know what one of the most wicked things about, whoo, oh, Sister Holiness, you're going to like this one. Get ready to shout a little. Because you're actually going to appreciate this. <laughs> one of the worst things about television, one of the most evil, ungodly things about television is not the programming. It's the advertising. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because you're constantly having someone flash images in front of your face and trying to suggest to you that what you got ain't good enough, you need this instead. Mm -hmm. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. That's right. I lived in an apartment over here on Throckmorton. Two bedroom, two bath, or what, uh, really it was two bedroom, almost like a two and a half bath. But anyhow, each bedroom had its own bath, but the, the bath in the middle excuse me, the bathtub and shower was actually in the middle between the two upstairs bathrooms. So you could approach it from either side. But each bedroom had its own commode and its own sink. And then you had the bath in the middle, so it's kind of like two baths upstairs. Then downstairs was half a bath. I love that apartment. I love that apartment. I, I really did. I'd probably still be living there if it weren't for certain circumstances that... Uh, Kind of forced my, have, my having to move out. I went and I moved over to uh, Hondo over here. Hondo was small. I've got so much junk, it's not even funny. I mean, I've got stuff. Lord have mercy. Especially when I don't have a church office. Because then all my office stuff has to be at the house. And, I mean, and here I am in a little one bedroom. 
That place was crowded as all murder. But did I crab and complain every day, Booby, about how crowded my apartment was? Was I so miserable and so unhappy? No. No. I was pleased I had an apartment. I liked my little apartment. It was a nice little apartment. I liked I had too much stuff for it. If I had any complaint, it wasn't about the apartment, it was about I had too much stuff. I moved out to Garland, had me a two bed a two bedroom, two bath apartment in Garland. I was able to move into a bigger one uh, at one point because I was approved for Section Eight, and that allowed me to get into a bigger space, and which accommodated my stuff a little better. Neither one of these places was the Taj Mahal. Neither one of these places were luxury apartments. Neither one of them had, you know. Uh, all kinds of accoutrements and all kinds of benefits and all this great stuff. Uh, but you know what? I promise you, I was happy as a clam everywhere I've lived. I, wherever I am, I'm happy where I'm at. Our little house now, I've said to Booby a hundred times, I love this little house. This is a great little house. Now, Sean, I can look at all the things wrong with it. I can complain about, you know, there ain't enough room. There ain't blah, 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 but there, there's plenty of room. The problem in the room, the problem is I'm a junk collector and I never know when to say no. If I see a rubber band on the ground, I pick it up. If I see a, you know, a paper clip on the floor, I pick it up. If I see a thumbtack, I pick it up. I may need that one day. <laughs> It's not, you know, the space isn't the problem. It's my junk. It's my, my habit of collecting every little doodad that I see. You know, that is my problem, okay? But the point is, James says, every man is tempted, not most men. Every man is tempted, every person, man and woman, when they are drawn away of his own lust and enticed. If you look real carefully... At the struggle you're in today, if you will be honest with yourself for just one minute, if you'll seriously consider for one second the hardship that you're in, there's more likely than not, you're going to find that at the root of that problem is your desires and your Wanting something. I know more people have relationship problems and they come to me for relationship counseling. And I'm gonna tell you just as I'm gonna tell you just straight up as I can tell you. The number one problem with 90% of relationships that experience trouble, they should never have happened. Did you hear me tonight? Everybody quiet as a church. Well, oh, we're not shouting tonight. <laughs> the number one problem with 90% of relationship issues is the relationship should never have happened to begin with. People made really bad choices. Oh, that's powerful. Yeah, I got some people. I see little wheels turning in people's heads tonight. Sean, we were just talking the other day about some things. Sometimes a person can be a wonderful person. That doesn't make them the person for you. You can love somebody till the cows come home. That does not mean they are the correct and right person for you. I was in a relationship for years, several years, with somebody that I was crazy about. I thought was my soulmate. Oh, you know. And I can tell you right now, Tommy and I just boy. Last night I heard a song. We were we went out to eat at, at a at a Furs, and all of a sudden I started hearing a song on the radio. And dear Lord Almighty, it got my wheels turning. It got my brain going. And all of a sudden, Sean, I got to feeling so bad. You know how that'll happen, how a song will stir up. I got to feeling so bad, I began to talk with Booby about it. We had a nice, long talk. I am your lady. 
You are my man. Whenever you reach for me, I'll do all that I can. We're headed for something, somewhere I've never been. Sometimes I am frightened, but I'm ready to learn the power of love. My heart got so heavy that I could barely stand it. Because my whole life, all I ever wanted, Jack, was somebody that believed in me. All I ever wanted was somebody that loved me in spite of myself. My dad made me feel like I was the most unlovable, hideous thing on the planet. And that I was never going to be nothing. I was never going to amount to anything. All I wanted Sean out of life was one person on this planet to look at me and see the exact opposite of that. That's all I ever wanted. I was with Jason for years. You know what? Bottom line, he was adorable. Cute as a button. Was not the right person for me. Now, years later, I can look back and I can expound on every reason why that was not the right person for me. I went through several years, Sean, of lots and lots and lots of aggravation, depression. I mean, you, oh, you have no idea. But I was in love. Honey, if you're in love and miserable, something's wrong. If you're in love and miserable, something is wrong. Amen. I'd rather be happy by myself than miserable with somebody. But you see, I saw this beautiful face. I saw this personality that attracted me. I saw, you know, certain attributes that I found just wildly attractive. And for the sake of those few things, I overlooked a whole tr truck full of negativities that were as obvious as the nose on my face. But I overlooked them. Why? Because I was enticed by my own lusts and my own desires. You follow what I'm trying to tell you? People, when we look at that term, desire, they're drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Immediately, everybody thinks sexual. The minute you see the word lust, everybody thinks sexual. I've got news for you. If the desire in your heart is simply to be loved by somebody... That desire can mislead you. That desire can take you in the wrong direction. That desire can motivate you to make all the wrong decisions. Is it a bad desire? No, but it's yours. Mm -hmm. Oh, hallelujah. Woo, children, we're going, I told you, James, we're going to talk some scripture around here. There are a lot of things, Sean, that are part of us that aren't bad in and of themselves, but if we let them rule us, uh -huh. they will take us in the wrong direction every time. Amen. And we will wind up in a mess over... <laughs> Look who's talking. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Having been through more relationships than most people go through Scott Tissue. And there's a thousand sheets on a roll. So just imagine. Alright? You have no idea how many people I dated. You have no idea how many people I went out with. You have no idea how many people I do things with that I probably shouldn't have done things with. And not a one of them was it because I was looking just to... Mm, try to be nice and we'll try to say this thing. You know, have a good time. Just, you know... Get my groove on. That wasn't what motivated me. What motivated me was a desperate desire to be loved by somebody, but it still led me in all the wrong directions. Uh -huh. A lot of people that watch this video, 
A lot of people in this room, you, you, there, there are things, you've gone through hell and high water in your life. At work, in your family, in your relationships. You've lived in a hundred houses in ten years. And if you want to be honest with yourself for just one single minute, you'll realize that at the root of the issue is you. It boils down to something you want. And if you don't get what you want, you move on. You do something different. You try something else. See, once again, our, our desires are enticing. Our desires are leading us. Do you follow what I'm trying to say tonight? All right? God doesn't use these techniques. Part of being a human being is... We have emotional desires, we have physical desires, we have necessities in terms of food, water. I was living out of my car as a young man here in Texas. My, my landlady, I was renting a little apartment on the back of this lady's house, and she came down with cancer. And because there was a door between her kitchen in my kitchen, because my apartment is just a little studio apartment on the back of her, her house. Uh, there was a door between my kitchen and hers. She came to me and said, Charles, I hate to have to ask you this. She said, but I need a live-in nurse, and I need this apartment so I can have a live-in nurse. Is it possible for you to move? Well, I was only 16, 17 years old, and I, of course, didn't want to hold her up. And so I didn't have the money to move. Man, I was just scraping by, you know, paying the rent, <laughs> the skin of my teeth as it was. I didn't have the money to move. So I wound up living, Sean, out of the back of my old, I think it was a Pontiac station wagon. For several weeks. And at one point, this man I met at a 7-Eleven, I used to go into the 7-Eleven and hang out. I knew some of the people that worked there. You gotta remember, I was just a teenager, you know. And I would go in there and I'd hang with them and talk to them and all that, you know, had nowhere to go. I didn't have a house, couldn't watch TV, couldn't, you know, do anything. And uh, this guy used to come in and he talked to me and everything. And one day he offered me to move in with him. So I understand, you know, you're, you're homeless. You don't have a house right now. You don't have a place to live. So, well, well, you can come live with me. Blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> well, I'm going to tell you, my desires, there wasn't nothing wrong with my desires. They were based on need. My desires said, do it. You'll have a roof over your head. Do it. You'll have food in your mouth. Do it. Your needs will be met. But the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, don't do it. Don't you do it. So the next day I saw him and he said, well, did you think about it? You know, have you thought about it? And I said, yeah. I said, I prayed about it. I said, and honestly, um, I don't believe I'm going to do that right now. This guy had a fit. Started yelling and screaming to me how stupid I was. How was I going to live on the street? I'd rather live in a car than have a place in it. Something was going on in this boy's mind, in this man's mind. Only God knows what I'd have walked into if I'd allowed my own lusts, my own desires. Again, there is... That those terms do not immediately imply something evil. Right. Has nothing to do with being evil. But your own lust, your own desires, even if they're born of necessity, mm -hmm. when you let them dictate what you do and how you do it, that's why the Word of God said, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You want, you want to live a carefree life? You want things to go pretty smooth? 
you listen to the Lord. That's right. Let the Lord lead you. Mm -hmm. You'd be amazed. I'm going to tell you, Tommy and I have been together. We're working on our 11th year right now. I'm going to give him a little bit of credit. Give him a lot of credit. To a huge degree, this has been some of the most carefree years I've had in my entire life. To a huge degree. When he told me his background and how he grew up, the first day I met him, honey, if he wasn't so cute and looked so good in his little hussy outfit, I probably, <laughs> I probably would have just turned around and walked away right then and there. And there were a number of times, and I'm not saying this to embarrass him, I'm not saying this to to be mean, he, we've talked about it. He understands what I'm saying. There were a number of times we had conversations about God, about Scripture, about, and some of the things come off his lips. I mean to tell you, I literally had to go home. And I was telling the Lord all the way home, Lord, that is the last time I will ever, ever go to that boy's house. I will never see him again. I don't want anything to do with him. He's a heathen. He's going to split hell wide open. And the whole time he ain't going to believe hell's real because Jehovah's told him it wasn't. When he gets there, he's going to know it's real in about 10 seconds. And I'm telling you, if I'm not kidding, I'm a serious heart attack. Like, I was so over it. Something that I desired was not being satisfied. I wanted somebody that believed like I did. I wanted somebody on the same page as I was. Is that a wrong thing? Not at all. But you got to listen to God. And the Spirit of the Lord will speak to me and say, Give Him time. And I said, Lord, unless you plan on coming, in the year 6,344, there ain't enough time left on this clock for this boy to ever get saved and get his stuff together. It ain't going to happen. Lord, talk about lack of faith. I'm being honest. I said, Lord, I, I, I don't see it. And I didn't. I'm not kidding. I didn't see it. I'm not kidding. But the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me said, give him time. And the main thing that motivated me through the whole first part of our relationship, God is my witness, was my concern for his salvation. That was the main concern I had because when I was sick of dealing with it and it was more than I really cared to put up with Jack and wanted to walk away, the Holy Ghost said, don't you do it. Don't you do it. If I'd have let my own lusts, if I'd have let my own desires, if I'd have let my own have its way, I'd have gone in a whole different direction. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The last ten and a half years have been pretty, pretty good. In a lot, a lot, a lot of ways. Way better than anything I ever had before. By a million miles. Sean, I could be out there having all kind of grief, having all kind of trouble, having all kinds of struggles, having all kind of aggravations. And you know what the cause of them would be? My own desires. What I wanted. Even whether those desires are based in evil thoughts and evil lusts or whether those desires are based on good and godly desires. It doesn't matter. You've got to follow the leading of the Holy Ghost. I've told you a bunch of times. He and I did not move in together for eight years. Eight years. He and I talked about it. And I told him, we ain't nowhere near ready. We're not near didn't I, Booby? Mm -hmm. I said, we're not ready. There's no way in the world. Uh -uh. Well, no, this is not the right time. You following what I'm trying to help you understand tonight? What James is telling us. See, 
the church. Glory to God. Always loves to interpret this, Jack, just a very narrow way. A very specific way. And boy, I mean, they get into the toilet real fast with this passage of Scripture. They get into sex and lust and desire with, as if that's the only way in the world you can be led in the wrong direction. Right. Right. All right, Moose, you can, honey, you can get into the wrong stinking apartment and wind up going through hell and high water. Yes, Amen. You can get into the wrong car and wind up getting going through hell. You can get into the wrong relationship and go through hell and high water. You can have the wrong friends wind up going through hell and high water. You can take the wrong job and wind up going through hell and high water. Hello now. Amen. Amen. This passage is not about sex. It is not about lust. It is not about what you do with this part of your body and blah, blah, blah. That is not what this passage is about. There is so much more to what James is saying here. And then he said, Then when lust hath conceived, when our desires have given birth, it bringeth forth sin. What is the very nature of sin? What, what is at the base of all sin? We just talked about it Sunday. Unbelief. 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 You want to see somebody quit believing God? Let them allow their own desires to lead them in the wrong direction so they're doing the wrong thing, they're with the wrong person, they're driving the wrong car, they're in the wrong job, they're in the wrong relationship, and they're praying and praying and praying for God to fix it, and God never fixes it. Uh -huh. What happens? Oh, God, don't hear me pray. I'm not sure there is a God. Sweetheart, the problem isn't with God. You're asking God to fix something that you should have never gotten into to begin with. That's right. When you get into that position and you're not getting the answer that you're looking for, you might just want to stop and examine for a minute and ask the Lord, Lord, are you not doing anything because this is entirely the wrong direction for me? Mm -hmm. Are you not fixing him because you don't want me with him? Ho oh, oh, ho! Hallelujah! Right. Are you not fixing her because you don't want her with me? Are you not helping me at work get more money because this ain't the job you wanted me on to begin with? Are you not moving in this situation in my apartment because you didn't want me living here to start with? Sweetheart, I got news for you. God uses circumstances. To help you find his perfect will. That's right. If the Lord ain't changing what's there, then what's there should not be there. And you're in the wrong place with the wrong person in the wrong situation or driving the wrong automobile. <laughs> How do you like them apples? So don't quit believing God because something didn't change it. No! If something didn't change it, <coughs> you need to find out why. Right. You're out of the will of God. That's right. You're in the belly of the whale, fool. Hmm. And you will not get out of the belly of the whale until you what? Repent. Uh -huh. Turn around. Go the other way. That's right. Make up your mind you're going to do what God told you to do to begin with. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Woo, this is good holiness preaching tonight. Right. Amen. I don't know anybody out there tonight with hair stacked up on their head that shouldn't be in total agreement with everything I'm saying tonight. That's mm -hmm. right. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. It brings unbelief into the picture. And unbelief, when it is finished, what did it do for the children of Israel that came out of Egypt? Every one of them that died, that, that uh, walked in the wilderness for 40 years died in the wilderness. When it is finished, it bringeth forth death. Mm -hmm. My Lord, have mercy. Mm -hmm. Unbelief, my friend, 
will not ever bring life into your situation. It never gives birth to life. It always will ultimately lead to death. I've seen people who uh, live their lives doing what they want to do, letting their own desires motivate them, whether they be desires of necessity, whether they be desires of the flesh, whether they be godly desires. But they don't follow the leading of the Spirit. And I'm telling you, I have literally watched people wind up committing suicide. I have literally watched people dead at 40 years old, at 35 years old, at 28 years old. Let's look at Whitney. I guarantee if she'd been following the Lord, what happened would not have happened. If she'd have let the Lord lead her. Oh, but isn't it God's will for me to be successful and make lots of money? Not necessarily. That's right. You may not be able to handle it. You may not be able to know what to do with it. Honey, if I've got to be broken poor my whole life to make heaven, then so be it. So long as I make heaven. You hear me now. See, that commercialism that is preached to us tells us to be successful. You've got to have money falling out of your ears. To be successful, you've got to have the praises of multitudes. To be successful, you've got to have celebrity. To be successful, you've got to drive this kind of car. You've got to live in that kind of house. You've got to wear these kind of shoes. You've got to have this kind of jewelry. Hello now. Uh -huh. If only with me had obeyed the voice of God along the journey. The Lord might have been speaking to her. Whitney, sing for me and only me. Yeah, you won't make a whole bunch of money doing it, but your life will be better. Be a whole lot longer. Mm -hmm. You following me tonight, folks? I'm telling you, this is important principles. James is a powerful book. There, there is so much here. And, and it's all because in the King James we read words like tempted. And we read words like lust and enticed. And we apply a 20th century definition to that word. Which was not used. In, this translation was not created in the 20th century. Psalm 47, oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. For the Lord most high is terrible. <laughs> terrible? <laughs> terrible? What a horrible thing to say. <laughs> terrible, in modern English, has a negative denotation, meaning a negative dictionary definition and a negative connotation which means a negative uh, implication. The term automatically when you hear the word terrible you immediately have a negative implication attached to it. But in the time of King James terrible meant awe-inspiring. That's what that term literally translates. Awe-inspiring. So Psalm 47 literally says, Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is awe-inspiring. That's, right. mm -hmm. That's right. But we read, For the Lord Most High is terrible. <laughs> and I'll bet you there's some idiot out there like Jerry Falwell or one of these knuckleheads. And they see the word terrible and they'll let you know God can be me when he needs to. <laughs> there are times when God will strike terror into your spirit. Hallelujah, glory to God. That's not what it means. That's not what it means. You're following me tonight. We read this in, in James. We read these words and we apply a 20th century definition. And guess what happens? You lose the truth. You literally lose the truth. 
Because you're buying into a lie. You're buying into a false interpretation instead of a truthful interpretation of what James is trying to say. And there are churches full of people tonight, full of people, right. as big as Joel states. And show up, the preacher in the pulpit is telling those people tonight that this passage refers to sex. This passage has to do with carnal desire. This passage has to do with the lust of the flesh. And it goes so far beyond that, it's not even funny. That's right. That's right. Even your own godly desires can get you into trouble uh -huh. if they're not tempered by the Spirit. Man. You may want something so bad. I, I like our church. I'll use this as an example. I've wanted some things for this ministry so bad that I've rushed things. And I've had to own that. And I've had to admit it. And I've had to say it. And I'm embarrassed to have to admit it. I feel the fool. <sighs> Will we ever do these things? You betcha. But was it the time to do them when I wanted to do them? Not necessarily. Were the desires bad, Jack? No. Did the desires bring a trial? <laughs> Did the yes. desires bring hardship? Yep. Did the desires bring struggle? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Were they bad desires? No. But the timing was wrong. I wasn't hearing from heaven. I was letting my desires dictate rather than letting God dictate my desires. You, you follow? This building come available to us, everything just has fallen together in such a way. I've never been so calm in my life about anything. Amen. I'm telling you, I've never been so calm in my life. That man told me he'd have a lease ready for us today, Tuesday. We didn't have the money until yesterday. You talk about it. Yeah. Woo, glory. We didn't have the money till yesterday. <laughs> and you asked Tommy if I was running around like a lunatic like I have in the past. <laughs> I don't know what to do. We got to have the money. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Oh, God. Begging and pleading. Just screeching and screaming. <laughs> Not this time. Uh -uh, I learned my lesson. Been down that road. I said, Lord, if you want us to have it, we'll have the money. If you don't, we won't. When you want us to have it, you'll give us the money. If you want, maybe you don't want me to sign the lease tomorrow. Maybe you want me to sign the lease later in the month. Maybe you want me to sign it next month. Maybe you want us to wait an extra month. Whatever, whatever. And that's how I felt. Literally, that's how I felt. Didn't send the landlord here a note about us moving till last night. Because I wasn't sure when everything's going to fall together. I'm sick and tired of trying to put God on my timetable. Uh -huh. Sean, been down that road too many times, and you know what? Kicked me in the head a time or two. And now I can't go over it. <laughs> I can't do it no more. If I get keep in the head one more time, I won't be able to talk. Because <laughs> this donkey has his. <laughs> I've been kicked around too many times. Oh, I'm telling you, children, this is powerful. This is wonderful stuff tonight. When unbelief has conceived, it will result in death. Listen to what... James goes on to say, Do not err, my beloved brethren, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God can't be tried. He can't be tested. How can you test somebody who always knows exactly what he's doing and there's never a question or a doubt? 
in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Honey, God knows exactly what he's doing from minute one. Yes, he does. There ain't a question in his mind at all. Not one single thing, even a shadow of turning. Never mind reaching a fork in the road. He don't even see a shadow that leans out a little bit different than the direction he's taken. <laughs> my Lord, have mercy. Said, do not err, my beloved brethren. Whatever you do, don't get this wrong. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Amen. He started out by telling us, don't you dare put this evil in our world on God's step. Don't you dare put wickedness and the terrible things in this life that try and torment human beings. Don't you dare put that on God's step. Then he said, but don't you make a mistake, children. Every good gift, every perfect gift, now that comes from God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Those things, yes, that comes from God. Absolutely that comes from God. That's why <coughs> I teach people, and I've been through this with Tommy for the last ten and a half years. I don't care if you get a front parking space at Kroger when you're tired and you drive out there to buy a gallon of milk and you don't want to have to walk very far and all of a sudden that parking space right at the front, right next to the handicap spot, is free. You say, thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Every good gift. Yes. Every good gift. I thank God for every little stupid thing. <laughs> You'd look at me and think I'm crazy. I stood in front of that little church building today and started getting a little happy, didn't I? And I said, Booby gets embarrassed by me when I do my happy dance and I'm in the middle of Lowe's or I'm in the middle of uh, Home Depot because I got what we needed on clearance plus a 10% discount for it being a demonstration model. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And Booby's all turning. Well, however, black people turn. <laughs> kind of looks Indian, you know. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? Every good gift. That's why the Word of God teaches us to be thankful in all things, great and small. Learn to live a life of thankfulness. Learn to make a habit of being grateful for the small things, not just the big. Don't just wait until God plops $10,000 in your lap to say, thank you, Jesus. That's right. When somebody at the restaurant says, well, I forgot to ring up your drinks, so here they're on us tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Uh -huh. That's right. Last Tuesday night, after church, we went to Carl's Jr. I wound up getting three drinks for free. Didn't cost me nothing. Thank you, Jesus. That's almost six bucks I didn't have to spend. Do you know how many times, Sean, God's done that for me? You can't, I, you can't even count. I've gone into restaurants. Tommy and I one time went to, I forget where we went exactly. And I, I have an issue these days when I have to use a restroom. Pardon me, but I gotta use a restroom. I'm not trying to be real personal, you know, but I love getting old. <laughs> Lord have mercy. My body don't forgot how everything's supposed to work. I say hold and it says, huh, go? No, hold, hold, hold. So when I get certain urges, sometimes I say, oh, I'm going to pull into McDonald's, run in the restroom. Well, I hate to use a business's restroom unless I buy something. 
because I feel like, you know, I'm using their facility and the least I can do is buy a drink. I constantly have my drink. I constantly have a big old cup or something. So I think I might as well at least buy a drink, you know, and that way I've, I've at least uh, allowed them to make something while well, I might be in there. It's not fair for me to just go in and use their... And I understand if you don't have any money and all that, it's reasonable. But I mean, if I have money, I'll try to buy a drink or an apple pie, or at least use the bathroom break as an excuse to eat an apple pie. <laughs> so I went ahead and I went up to the counter and ordered me a drink. And this guy's doing whatever he's doing, you know, and he hands me the cup. And I'm standing there, and I said, well, how much is it? And he said, oh, no, it's on us. I still don't know why. I have no clue. I'm trying to give them my money to pay for my use in their restroom, but what do they do? They give me a drink for free. <laughs> Folks, I'm telling you, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. You get in this way called faith and you walk it the way you ought to walk it. And I'm going to tell you, as the old song says, there shall be showers of blessing. You won't believe how the Lord will bless you. Uh -huh. Everybody think, oh, the preacher just wants my money when he's up there talking about tithing. Oh, let me tell you, you do this thing right. You live it like God wants you to live it. And honey, you're going to be having rain sprinkling on you from heaven everywhere you go. Uh -huh. You'll be amazed. And if you think about it for one minute, if you say, thank you, Jesus, every time some little tiny thing come along. Sean, if I were to add up all the free drinks, <laughs> the free meals, the, uh, the discounts that I've gotten when I go into a thrift shop, here I am at a thrift shop, so I'm paying cheap to begin with. Right. We got people that manage and work thrift shops that just like Tommy and I so much that when we go in there, how much is this? Four ninety nine? Okay, forty nine cents. <laughs> I'm serious. You won't believe how God will bless you. He will give you divine favor. Amen. That's right. People, the word of God said. Give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shake it together, run it over. Shall men give unto your bosom? That's right. Yeah, that's right. God will use people to bless you. Everywhere you turn, you'll be getting blessed. And if you if you could, I can't. There's no way in the world I could sit down and, and write out all the money I've saved. I'd almost be willing to bet you I've saved as much as I've made. Seriously. Look what happened with our lease today. That's right. Over a hundred dollars a month. That's twelve hundred dollars a year. That's thirty six hundred dollars over the course of three years, folks. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no... The Father of lights. Comes down from the Father of lights. Mm -hmm. What are the lights? Inspire, reveal, truth. Mm -hmm. It's the Father of lights. You're the lights. He's our Father. We're the lights. Jesus said, Ye are the light of the world. That's right. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. God's going to give you what you need to shine. Mm -hmm. The Lord will give you a testimony so you got something to say someday. That's right. Come on now. The Lord's going to bless you so you got something to tell somebody about. Amen. He's going to put oil in your lamp. So your light can shine brightly. Uh -huh. What good, what light, how much light would you be for Jesus if God didn't ever do nothing for you know how? Hello now. Uh -huh. Think about it. How much, how much light would you have to shine if your whole life God never did jack spot for you and you know when you just went through life and the Lord never did nothing for me? But no, he's constantly, every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. 
Oh, my Lord, have mercy. With whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Wow. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. He creates with nothing more than his own will through his word. God speaks his will and it is so. It is done. One day the Lord sat in heaven and said, Gabriel, you're saved. Did not say, Gabriel, you will be saved. You hear me? Did not say this. said, Gabriel, you're saved. Because when God says it, it's done. Come on now. Sean, you're healed. Tommy, you're full of the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. <laughs> By his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Well, we got as far as verse 19. <laughs> we made it through six whole verses. <laughs> 12 through 18. My, 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 my. But this has been good. Uh -huh. Amen. Isn't the Word of God wonderful? Oh, children, I want to tell you. I'm telling you. Oh, my God, have mercy. I said it Sunday. I'll say it again. That old song said, Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. I'm telling you, it, the Word of God is the most precious gift that God ever gave to His people. This is, that's why it hurts me when I see people that have a misunderstanding of the nature of God's Word. When I see people who speak ill of the Word of God because they don't know what's in there. They think they do because they've heard somebody represent it incorrectly. But they don't know what's really in there. Because honey, if you know what's really in there, I'm going to tell you right now, if this city, if people in this city knew what's really in that book and they knew we're talking about it, this place couldn't even begin to hold us and the building we're Amen. going to couldn't either. That's right. Amen. That's right. Couldn't hold everybody. Because the Word of God is so precious and you preach the truth, the pure truth. Yes. The pure truth. Let, just let the book say what it says. Don't add to, don't take away. Don't try to embellish, don't try to Make it say what you think you want it to say. Just let it say what it says. Right. And I'm going to tell you right now, you'll be one happy camper. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Brother Jack, would you do me a favor? Close the service with prayer tonight.